Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Bonathan Carlin. And I'm Jen Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffin Door, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands and dust off your broomsticks and join us as we unlock the secrets behind Philosopher's Stone, Chapter 12, The Mirror of Erised. Oh, man. From the very beginning of this whole show, this is like the chapter that I was like, I, I was so excited. for. You're so excited for this one. I was very excited for it. And I actually I did really bad math the first time uh, that I was reading uh, that I was trying to like figure out when chapter 12 would land based on like we started on like October 1st. And I think originally I was like, oh, my gosh, the Mirror of Air said chapter 12 is going to land like on the episode that would come out around Christmas. Man. And I, I failed to realize that we released the first three episodes on day one. And yeah. It was not accounting for that. And yeah. therefore, we are only nine weeks from the original start date. Yeah. Uh, and so and not 12. Yeah. So we're but even we're, three weeks from now isn't Christmas. It's close. Well, it is close, as of yeah. recording, as of recording, yeah. yeah. But on release, that's day, true. It's you're right. Different. You're yeah. right because you're, that's what I'm thinking of. I'm like, it's not. You not only messed up some math. <laughs> <laughs> we're not even close. Listen, man. Yeah. I went to wizard school, and they don't teach math. They don't there, teach so. math. Anyway, they, um, don't, they don't have seven sided coins either. Jay, tell me how you feel about the mirror of Erised as a mirror. chapter. What what do we have inside of this chapter? All right. So basically, uh, it's just a basic plot summary of it. It is Christmas at Hogwarts and Harry and basically just the Weasley brothers are left at the Gryffindor common room where together they eat about a hundred turkeys for dinner. <laughs> I, wrote the, uh, I wrote the same thing down at the feast. I'm like, why is it why so, is big? Like, so big? This is way too much food. Way too much food. Um, and then uh, Harry gets the cloak of invisibility, which he takes out um, into the castle on Christmas night and discovers the mirror of Erised where he sees his parents for the the very first time and then he brings Ron to see it and then on the third night Dumbledore reveals himself and it's like I've been watching you the whole time Harry <laughs> just like that that's how you interpret Dumbledore just like that it was it, it would it <laughs> back would again Harry it would change it would change the way in which I interpret the character rather <laughs> drastically I feel like it's amazing how much the delivery you know it's like yeah back again Harry yeah versus like <laughs> Back again, Harry. I know, yeah. It sounded like if he's just sort of like some kooky old old wizard. You you love kooky Dumbledore, though. I do general. love kooky Dumbledore. Yeah. It's mostly it's all sourced from the uh, Potter Puppet Pals back in the day, which was like, uh, I mean, if you don't know what Potter Puppet Pals is, I have great news for you. If you're 12 episodes into this Harry Potter podcast and haven't heard of it, whoo. It is a trip down memory lane. It is a hilarious series. But anyway, uh, the Dumbledore in that, they, he just looks like a little hand puppet, but he just talks. He's just sort of like a total goofball. <laughs> he is a total goofball. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's very kooky. Um, so I would recommend go and check that out. But whenever I do um, Dumbledore voice, I always think that's a really funny one. If you've ever seen... Um, uh, what is it? A very Potter musical. It feels like that's the Dumbledore they also kind of sourced for their Dumbledore in that play. Interesting, interesting, <laughs> yeah. interesting. He's yeah. just sort of very, just, yeah, very goofy and like, yeah, I'm the smartest one, but I'm not really paying attention to anything. Right, right, yeah. right. Well, and there's no doubt. I mean, he's a fun-loving, whimsical guy, so there's there's that to be said yeah. for him. But anyway, let's let's go ahead and comb through the chapter because I did yes. have I did have lots of notes, but I also had some like swaths of time where I didn't have any notes, which kind of surprised me because this was like the chapter that I really thought things were going to get go uh, whiz bang pow which to be fair they do and if you subscribe to Dumbledore's big plan which I absolutely do there's lots of evidence this, inside of this chapter this for is it. one of those chapters that is absolutely like like a huge this is like the the huge Dumbledore's big plan is officially like this is where you can point many arrows to yes to be like no Dumbledore is absolutely setting things up for Harry. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It feels like there can be just literally no mistake. So yeah. um, anyway, let's let's go ahead and kick things off uh, as we dive into the very first paragraph. There's always like one of these fun little little bits that I'm, I I feel without knowing, I know you also highlighted. Which I is, absolutely did. It is the Weasley twins, <laughs> twins were punished for bewitching several snowballs, so they followed Quirrell around, bouncing off the back of his turban. Oh, my gosh. It's just like like the fur on your first pass of the book, you'd be like, <laughs> "Oh, Quirrell, he can't even defend himself from the students." <laughs> right, yeah, and, but yeah, like Fred and George. Yeah, oh man, <laughs> that's hilarious. But then when you read it, it's like the Weasley twins were like having snowballs hit Voldemort in the face, which is 
just epic. Yes, <laughs> like, yes. They yes, don't yes, even yes. know. It's just like a- it doesn't say who punished them, but I always I never take it as Quirrell punished the Weasley twins. Right, you right. Know, he's yeah. just sort of letting it happen. Like I imagine Voldemort's like Quirrell. What right. are you doing? He has to, yeah, like he has to maintain like his sort of like pushoveredness. Yeah. Uh, you know, re, like the the fainting at trolls kind of behavior. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, he's he's definitely yeah. So it, I, it, it wasn't Quirrell. It wasn't Quirrell. Almost certainly Snape. Yeah. I feel, Almost God, certainly God. Snape. Yeah. yeah. Could absolutely be it. Um, so yeah, I love that just little inclusion, little uh, little nod to hitting Voldemort in the face. There. It it talks about how cold the castle is. Like a bitter wind rattled the windows. A windows. You know, the corridors had become icy is what it says. The drafty corridors had become icy. I'm always like, why is this the case? Like, can't you, shouldn't it like magically be warm in the castle? You <laughs> like, know, that's a good point. I like literally I was about to say, I was about to point out the fact that I was like, Jay, it's a castle. You know, it's yeah. a stone structure. It's a magic it, castle, it, Ben. It, yeah, it's a, but it is in fact shouldn't a magic castle. Shouldn't have these problems. Th- this is one of those things where I tend to imagine the corridors to absolutely be inside of the castle. And on some level, they just simply are. I, w- I wouldn't, I wouldn't like believe any other explanation. But like in inside of like Philosopher's Stone, we see lots of like courtyard related scenes where the corridor may literally bring you physically outside. Um, similar to like the breezeway we had, you know, yeah. in, in our middle school. That's you, true. You yeah, like could walk actually outside be to go outside. To lunch. Yeah, that's true. It could be the case like that. I also think especially a lot of times, I think a lot of times at Hogwarts, there is like this unwritten rule that Dumbledore like doesn't like like the fact that the the uh, corridors are like icy and windy and stuff. It's like it feels like a very magically fixable problem. And I feel like there's a lot of things that Dumbledore is like. I like things to be a, like a little more muggly than they need to be for the sake of the students having to overcome stuff. Yeah, this is boot camp. This is. I mean, <laughs> I, because not only is there stuff like this, but then later in the chapter we're going to meet um, Madame Pince. The oh the librarian, the librarian who has no interest in helping who has no interest in like helping the students find but it's just like there's too many teachers at a school who like just seem like they actively hate children yes you know it's like right. wh- why why would you have Filch working here why would you have a librarian who hates kids work at a school why would you have Snape who hates kids working at a school I mean Snape you know the reason S- but. Snape's a completely different story yeah. yeah but like no you're you're absolutely correct I mean it, even Hagrid, uh, I think, like sort of remarks like, "Wow, you guys are going to the library the day before break." Like, kinda, like he, he's kind of like, "Why?" Yeah. Um, and you know, so it's like, but if you're the librarian, you have to appreciate the kids who are the probably the only kids who are in the library attempting to like uncover information about something. So the only thing I would say is is they are specifically attempting to unearth what is otherwise a kind of like very obvious Hogwarts centric secret that's happening at the moment. So maybe maybe they are just like going and poking around and like pulling books that don't seem to like make any sense because if you're the librarian you know that these students are pulling books that are not related to their coursework right and and so on some level maybe madame pince is over there like what are they like i know i know they have no business being over there and well uh, yes but at the same time all the books they're pulling are just like history like modern history books basically yeah you know it's not like necessarily nefarious it's not like unusual potions of the 20th century or anything i do find it to be kind of interesting that that is like a little wink a little bit that all the books in particular that they're pulling all happen to be like witches and wizards of the modern age oh and, yeah you know, it's yeah. like because he's nicholas flamel is like 600 some year uh, odd right years old, so, so the problem is that like he, he's too old to be showing up in yeah they all have like a modifier that makes them recent it says great wizards of the 20th century not notable magical names of our time and then uh important modern magical discoveries recent developments in wizardry it's like yeah what what is the what is the thing like because there's another modifier that we'll eventually learn about uh, with the history of magic by Bathilda Bagshot where it's like yeah. she didn't cover anything after the 19th century, you know it's like a, it's oh. like a sim- like she's a historian right. not a like in the, up until very recently at least probably even as of the chapter we're reading right now is still alive yeah um and so like she's she's doing a history of magic not a modern retelling of what just happened right yeah, that's the news yeah <laughs> yeah she'll, she'll, she'll wait like 200 years for somebody else to be a historian to tell the the secrets of of today um anyway so as we as we 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 jumped ahead a little bit so let's let's move slower um there there is a scene that actually is like a little bit like joyous here which is that um malfoy is attempting to uh use his influence to spread sort of like negative feelings towards 
Harry, you know, basically making jokes about how uh, the Gryffindor Quidditch team might replace him with a wide mouth tree frog because Harry caught the snitch with his mouth. Um, but I, I love the fact that it's like then he'd realized that nobody found this funny because they were also impressed the way Harry managed to stay on his bucking broomstick. And it's just like we don't get many situations like this where Malfoy is actually like sort of like put back in his place. Yeah, like, right. It seems like most of the time Malfoy's propaganda against Harry just works. It does. It does normally seem like that. Like it, this isn't even like even the Slytherins. It's like, what do you what are you making fun of him? It's like he, he's like he hasn't really gotten good at like bullying Harry just yet. Or right, something. Like he's still honing his <laughs> he's like, skills. I'm still honing my skills. Right. He's like, I'm going to make fun of Potter for catching the snitch. Wait. Wait. They, he did. He did. Beat us. But he did beat Slytherin mm. by catching the snitch. Yeah. Right. So, mm. okay. New, new tack. New tack. Yeah. His new tack is so Malfoy, jealous and angry, had gone back to taunting Harry about having no proper family. Feels which, like. It, I, too far in the other direction. Overcorrection, too, it Malfoy. Is, it is an overcorrection. Yeah. This is like one of those where I'm like, Malfoy should have like lost some serious street cred in the process because that is like, I I don't care who you are and I don't care how mean other kids are at high school. I don't feel like people go this far. I know. This is too far. This it is, is way too far. It's blatantly mean. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I did. I I wrote, I, like, I, I could see the end of that sentence and I wrote the note mean and I was like, yeah, but Malfoy's always mean. But I'm like, no, you know what? That's still, that's just mean. It like, is. That's, that's, you know, even for him. Right, um, but uh, I love that. Even it's still, it's also as as way overcorrected it is. It's still ineffective against Harry because it says he didn't feel sorry for himself at all. Yeah, <laughs> that he'd be go. staying at Hogwarts um, uh, for uh, Christmas. I also like. Um, that it's uh, we so Harry we know obviously is at Hogwarts and then it says uh, Ron and his brothers were staying too because Mr. and Mrs. Weasley were going to Romania to visit Charlie. This to me feels super duper on purpose that like because this is Ron like if you're Molly and Arthur you've just sent your youngest son to his first year at Hogwarts right like they have not seen Ron their 11 year old son since September and they're like nah just stay <laughs> right we'll go and visit our adult yeah, son our instead. adult son right yeah we're gonna go do that like this is 1000% Molly and Arthur being like boys you need to stay with Harry <laughs> yeah and I you had know? two different thoughts about this one yeah. of them was that like thank goodness for Harry that somebody stayed back so that like he had friends for like his first Christmas away yes, from the Dursleys absolutely like, that, that is like that's so joyous but the other one is that Hermione actually goes home I know um, which is like one of those <laughs> things where I often feel like as sweet and kind and caring as Hermione Granger is there's there can be no doubt that like from the time she like leaves for Hogwarts her poor parents basically don't see her again yeah no I mean this they get to see her this Christmas but after this it's like sorry mom and dad I don't really like skiing I'd rather do homework I, yeah my friends need <clears> me <throat> yeah like that's like one of those things right I mean and, like and it's great like I'm glad that Hermione puts her friends you know like like holds them in such high regard and everything but it is it is almost comical how at all times it's like you really always sort of need to bend the rules enough so that Harry Ron and Hermione can be doing things together over the holidays <laughs> but when you zoom back it's like like as a as a now parent the the thought of like Addie even going to like like giving me all the way up until she's 18 and potentially leaving for college or whatever yeah but she left for college and didn't come home yeah until she was like like through through, through her senior year I would be like devastated yeah i'd be like wow good to see you i yeah, know but, but yeah. uh no but at that point in time if i hadn't seen her for four years i'd be like it is so good to see you i missed yeah. you so much right <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming back thanks for coming back anyway <gasps> um yeah so uh but but you're absolutely right again to back to dumbledore's boot camp they're in they're in uh, the dungeons for potions where they can literally like see their breath yeah you know in front of their face mm -hmm. um and then they they stumble across hagrid carrying in the 12 christmas trees for the holiday feast so ki kind of the the folks at hogwarts to give each student who stayed behind i know their, their own, own tree. christmas tree also good to know that boot camp extends to the staff as well because it always it always is hilarious to me that hagrid has to drag in 12 christmas trees which are enormous by the way oh yeah and yeah. it's just like like why should hagrid have to do this when magic exists <laughs> right, 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 like right. you're yeah. manually making this man carry trees <laughs> Like, even for Hagrid, have you ever tried to lift a tree? Because trees are heavy. Trees, tree, tree, mighty dense. Mighty Try, dense. Tree, but you know what's not heavy? For any, you know what? Magic, magic's not heavy. All anyone has to do is be like, Wingardium Leviosa. And it's in. Cool. Thanks, yeah. Hagrid. Thanks, Hagrid. 
Enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, the fact is, <laughs> especially because Hagrid has his wand. He has to like put on this charade. Charade. Of, of yeah. Dragon <laughs> and treason. Hagrid, what are you doing, man? <laughs> He's like, Professor Dumbledore, could I please? No, Hagrid. <laughs> we must keep up appearances. There's your quirky Dumbledore. There again. he is. Yeah, that there he is. Quirky Dumbledore who runs boot camp. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> Hagrid, are you finished manually dragging the trees in yet? Oh, my gosh. But so, yeah. Okay, so they, they run into Hagrid, who they're chatting with and then once again Malfoy uh, pops up and starts just like slinging mud again because mm-hmm. apparently he hasn't had enough of it today and right as Ron is diving at Malfoy Snape comes up the stairs and I just wrote down Harry and Ron have the worst timing and will continue to have the worst timing because a teacher will will find them on the wrong side of every single attack for the rest of their schooling like life. not that it even matters I mean Hagrid is there to watch the entire exchange and he's just like whoa Snape Snape, just so you know, that was totally warranted. And Snape's like, shut up, Hagrid. Yeah, but he, and he still takes five points from I them. Know. It's like, it's like, okay, Snape, you know what? Another another Hogwarts <clears throat> staff member literally just vouched for for these people. It's like, I think you, you need to let it go. And he's like, nah, five points anyway. Yeah. This, this is one of those things where people always make the joke at how at the end of the year, Dumbledore goes through and he's just like, 50 points to Harry, 50 points to Hermione. Oh, it's actually 60 to 60 Harry. To Harry. Yeah, yeah, he's I, more important. I caught yeah. myself. I caught myself. But like everybody is always sort of like, well, how much does does Gryffindor need to beat Slytherin? Okay, I'll, I can figure this out. I'll, yeah. I'll math, math, math. Yep, no problem. Mm-hmm. Um, but to be fair, like I almost feel like what Dumbledore is actually doing is like, yeah, Snape. Snape took off like a, just a like a buttload of points yeah. throughout the year. He's so like, like looking like, at the like, ledger. He's like, mm hmm, mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, this is this is like me in fantasy football where you get to the end of the season and you see that I've made the most waiver wire moves. Yeah. It's like it's like some people it's like, oh, they made six moves, you know, like seven moves, five moves, stuff like that. And then there's Ben, it's like thirty nine moves. <laughs> it's yeah. like like I, as as like a as like a piece of data, it stands out a lot. So if he has the ledger and he's sort of like, Okay, like who who deducted the most point? Oh, it was Snape and always to Gryffindor. How about yeah. that? Well, How you know, about that? There's no it's not even. It's not even. Yeah. You need to give it back. Although I mean to be fair, McGonagall takes off 150 points from Gryffindor herself. That, that, that is true. That is true. The, yeah. Nobody's harder on Gryffindor other than Snape and McGonagall. I know. McGonagall's really not helping the Gryffindors out in the House Cup race. That's the thing. She's just like, if we're going to earn it, we're going to earn it. We're going to earn it, people. This is and Snape's yeah. like, okay, I'm obviously not taking points from my house. Right. Duh. <laughs> yeah. That seems obvious. Minerva. <laughs> yeah. Rule number one. Don't, don't, don't like, yeah. Like be your own, yeah. uh, your own blockade. You almost should, like it's. It almost feels like the professors shouldn't be allowed to award uh, points from to their own house. It does feel or, that or way. like, right. or if you're the head of house, you shouldn't be allowed to award points to your house. That's a, yeah. Okay, so that's the other thing too. Yeah. So like, uh, McGonagall says, uh, is it McGonagall who says like Snape never let me live it down? You know, because Slytherin's won the House Cup for the past seven years. It's like, is it possible? Is it possible that Snape is just continuously giving his house more points. Oh, I know. Like, <laughs> like the point totals are right there on the wall. It's just like, hmm, Slytherin's losing by 40. Oh, Malfoy, that's a that's an epic charm you just did. 41 points for Slytherin. And that'll do it. That'll, that'll do, it. do it. Look at that. The clock's run out. Oh my goodness. We won again. Hooray. Uh, how about that? Yeah, I yeah. know. It's like, it's like McGonagall. This is an easy solve. Yeah, I know. Like you can, I mean... Yeah, that, it does seem like there needs to be some sort of checks and balances on the point system. It does feel that way. Yeah. It does feel that way. That's okay, though. Um, but b- especially because it's Christmas. It is, yeah. Um, yeah totally. Totally. So what, what do we have next then here? We have the decoration of the Great Hall, yep. which always sounds just truly amazing with Professor Flitwick's golden bubbles. Trivia blossom. question. Yeah, that is a good trivia question. Yeah. Did you highlight that? Or you I did. Just I just wrote, yeah, I just highlighted golden bubbles and was like, that's a trivia thing right there. Uh, one of my least favorite trivia questions that we always get is sort of like, which of these was not a decoration at the you know end of year feast or whatever it's like oh man i don't you know they list remember the, the there's, decor there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of you know icing on this cake so to speak uh it's, it's hard to remember all the mm-hmm. all the individual things yeah but either which way um so then you know they're <laughs> harry ron and hermione are telling uh hagrid about how the, ever since you mentioned nicholas from we've been trying to figure out who he is and hagrid's just like oh, what? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I've I told you it's nothing. Um, but yeah, so then they're like, you know, then Harry's like, oh, you just want to tell us and save us all the trouble? And Hagrid's like, no. Yeah. Oh, good times. Good times. Hilarious. Hilarious. It is almost po- it is humorous to me that he doesn't even show up in like great wizards of the 20th century because like you'd think Dumbledore would still show up in books like that. 
And like even on Dumbledore's chocolate frog card, like if you can choose he'll, where you get like five sentences, like right. one of the sentences is he knows Nicholas Flamel and did alchemy with him. So you'd right. think if there was like an entire, you know, chapter or page dedicated to Dumbledore, it would also mention Nicholas Flamel. Yeah, I mean, even even just simply important modern magical discoveries, like one way or another, I think the celebration of one's uh, 600th birthday, like each each century birthday would count as its own like reason to <laughs> yeah. to inscribe this accolade inside of a book. So yeah. Um. Anyway, yeah. That's 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 one where th- as ever, you know, it's it's it, this will this will also come up. Uh, see Goblet of Fire, second task where they can't find Gillyweed. Oh, that in one's any of the, the books. Mo- yeah, this one I'll let slide because there is a fun little like oh no, all the books were too recent like uh, thing in there, but th- th- that they cannot find. Find not just gillyweed, but a way to breathe underwater at all. Right, right. Is the, I mean, the other bananas. students. Yeah, it's like it's like the they the, like literally. If you're like a, a seventh year at Hogwarts, you know about the bubble head charm. Yeah, like, there is a textbook talking about the bubble head charm. Like, I mean, Harry's a fourth year. He's not that far away from just learning oh, I know. the spell. I know, and like like. Breathing underwater is something muggles have figured out, you know? Oh, yeah, it's yeah. Like, like, the ability to go beneath the surface is absolutely just like, like, even kindergartners know about scuba diving. Right. So it would be like, it's like, like, five-year-old wizards should know about the bubblehead charm or whatever mechanism there is for going underwater. Right. Because it's just such a, it's such a... <laughs> A thing that needs solving that should be easily solved. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. either which way, yeah, uh, you know, Harry gets kicked out of the library, and then it just says five minutes later, Ron and Hermione joined him, shaking their heads. They went off to lunch. This is like one of those where I'm like, well, why didn't Ron and Hermione just leave like at the same time as Harry? Yeah. It's like yeah, <laughs> Harry gets kicked out, and then they stayed for five more minutes. Like, it's like just just leave together. Harry's really the glue that holds the whole friendship together. Right. Hermione, yeah. Hermione and Ron are like, this is weird. <laughs> well, um, hi. You want to like, like maybe like seven years from now have a romantic interest or something? Yeah, you want to get like <laughs> married later on or something? Yeah, yeah, we'll get there when we get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Anyway, um, so that the hol- uh, Hermione then does, of course, leave uh, after we learned that both of her parents are dentists, yep. which is um, you know always always great to know. Yeah. Um, it's funny that they say make sure you ask them if they know who Nicholas Fumel is because like they could know. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's you a know, good point. like yep. you know, Nicholas Flamel is a, is a no name here in the Muggle world. It is, it is yeah. out here it, for this reason, right? Nicholas Flamel is in fact a or, or was in fact a, a real person. Yeah, um, he did not actually discover the Philosopher's Stone, but he was a real person. Yes, that's not just a made up name. Um, but yeah, so then the holiday um, festivities have begun after Hermione takes off to go back to dentist land. <laughs> yep, I love when they're sitting there um, roasting stuff on the fire and the examples they <laughs> that are given for the. It says they. Uh, uh, they sat by that. They sat by for an hour, eating anything they could spear on a roasting fork. Bread, English muffins, marshmallows. These are the three things. These are the anything things. they could find. Basically, bread, more bread, or marshmallows. Yes, yes. And I, I you know, I looked this up because I was just curious. Because I was like, I was like, you know, and what, there's a, there's like a kind of basic irony to it. But simply, English muffins is replaced in the British copy with crumpets. Oh, um, where crumpets, I think, are are for all intents and purposes similar like they are described as just like the british version of english muffins so okay. still still fairly similar but okay. it is interesting to me that english muffins is not a british thing that's true <laughs> you know well, i guess that makes sense because over there they'd just be muffins they would, that's but a, apparently they're crumpets <laughs> that's a good yeah they're crumpets and stuff yeah. so anyway but yeah i have i have often thought the exact same thing uh also like you know marshmallows are a very commonly like roasted on on fire type of thing but i never in my life have actually I, I am backtracking immediately as I was going to say. I was going to say, I don't think I've ever toasted bread over a fire. But when we were kids, mm-hmm. do you remember we had a uh, grilled cheese? I do remember it now that you're saying it. Yes, there was like you could put like a grilled cheese sandwich in this little cast iron thing and hold it over the fire and you would it would cook it, I guess. It was pretty neat. Yeah, that was that was pretty cool. Yeah, but okay, this is okay. just bread. This is this is just bread on stick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ron, Ron, get over here. Look what I can do. Toast. I'm toasting bread. <laughs> um, On a fire. Uh, the novelties of the magical world. I know. I know. Good uh, to, <laughs> speaking of which, I love that wizard chest is just chess. Is just chess. <laughs> and I love that it's like it's like it's chess that's almost harder to play. 
because because the chess pieces themselves sort of have like a a measure of their own sentience and they're yeah. sort of like like they can like argue with you or or sort of plead on their own behalf. Yeah, I'm like yeah, you over there like I don't want to. I'm gonna die. And it's like yeah, you're being sacrificed, friend. Get over there. And it's yeah. like I don't think we need to do that. <laughs> right, right. Just it almost just seems like it'd be easier to play regular chess. And the question I always have, though, is that, like, I feel like one accolade we absolutely can grant to Ron is that he seems to actually, genuinely be good at chess. Oh, I know. I felt like like this, it seems like when you read this book, like, this is going to be Ron's thing. It's like, if you ever watch um, Avatar, The Last Airbender, it's like, you know, Aang is the Avatar, and he can basically fight anyone and always win. And Katara is, like, the world's greatest waterbender, and she's, like, super good and has, like, healing abilities and stuff like that. Like, right. they are better in a fight than, like, like Sokka, who is the brother who cannot bend anything. Right. But, but without doubt, it is like, it is proven how invaluable Sokka is because as good as the other two are fighting, they are not good at strategy. And he's always got a plan and like, is like a key factor to the success. And it feels like Ron is being set up for that role. It's like, oh yeah, Ron, Harry, super powerful wizard, has got all the, all the power levels up. Patronus, great. Expelliarmus, great. But Ron has to like formulate where everyone's going to go and strike and stuff. And, and you know, when you look at the three of them, um, I sort of gave that like that rock paper scissors example where it sort of seems like each one of their like inefficiencies is made up by somebody else's like abilities. Yeah. You know, th this almost sort of me to me makes sense. Like Harry is central. He is you know sort of that like proverbial chosen one. Uh, he is uh, exemplary at defense against the dark arts. Uh, then you've got like Hermione who. Who is just like incredible like she's just like a wealth of knowledge i mean she's like like a walking like wikipedia yeah. where she can just like pull information but like it it does almost seem like there is the obvious trajectory where then like ron can sort of be like the person who like maybe doesn't have all the information maybe doesn't have all the abilities but does like it like is able to take the essential bits and sort of like formulate or help craft sort of like the the plan yeah. the objective like where we go from here and it seems like, th like that is exactly what this like chess accolade is supposed to be ultimately granting him. But I, but I'm wondering or curious if like as you're writing this particular character, if it doesn't too quickly become the case that like Ron almost feels like the mastermind. Like the issue is that if you give him too much of the ability, he almost like ends up inadvertently like casting a shadow. Right. Because so much of what they're running into is usually dealing with some measure of the unknown. So if Ron is really good at like combating the unknown and you like let that skill fly, then all of a sudden like you lose a lot of like, like even like them looking for Nicholas Fumel or Gillyweed, for example. Like, yeah. You know, this is like one of these things where it's like they can't find a solution and part of them not finding a solution is what drives the plot forward right exactly um, but it feels like ron should it feels like the sort of thing that ron should just know because he's the one with all the wizarding world knowledge exactly and kind of stuff yeah. yeah 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 like he can fill in a lot of the gaps that the other two like have their their deficiencies at yeah yeah, yeah. but that doesn't really end up being the case necessarily as we yeah. move forward it's more like he's just good at chess and he, which i do like that like hermione cannot beat him at chess like ever yes that <laughs> like is it, that is really cool it is a running character trait and it, it feels like she should be able to beat him like she should be able to think her way through it because that's the sort of thing she's good at. But he's like, nope, I got it. I always can see what you're, I always see it coming. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yep. And and so that being said, again, we we mentioned a little bit like the whole concept of Dumbledore's big plan, you know, at the beginning of, of the episode today. But this, the, the chess piece, like, and we'll see more examples of it throughout this particular chapter. But the chess piece is one of those where it's like, if like on some level we are being granted access to the specific skills that like each of these characters and on some level embodies that ultimately become the obstacles that we see towards the end of the book. Yeah. And this is another one of those where it's like, are the obstacles specifically curated to sort of like match the abilities of Harry and company? And it feels like, you know, the, the you got like a one for one with chess. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's just a, like a, like a dead ringer. And then the other one is of course the fact that Harry has just been made seeker. And one of the challenges is catching, is, yeah, keys. catching a winged key. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, we got that one and we'll, we'll get more as we continue to go. Um, one of the cool things I think is kind of fun is that like on Christmas Eve, it says Harry went to bed looking forward to the next day for the food and for the fun, but not expecting any presents at all. What's kind of neat about this is that like, especially through the lens of your typical 11 year old, um, the gifts very often are what make Christmas incredibly fun. Like, you know, as an yeah. 11 year old, you're, I mean, not that you're never like, you're not excited to see your family, you know, your extended family, grandparents, right. stuff like that. Um, but I, I feel like the, the, 
at least from my own personal experiences, it felt like the big draw was like, oh my gosh, like, you know, right. Christmas morning, <laughs> gifts, like presents, you know, there's like fun, excitement. I mean, you know, there's food and candy and like that, that type yeah. of stuff as well. Um, but I do love the fact that like, you know, with, with no expectation of gifts at all, Harry is just like, like joyous. Right. Yeah. You know, this is, this is fun. This is exciting. And it, 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 it uh, either which way he ends up getting gifts and he rather, sure does rather special ones. I know. He's surprised by it. Oh, Man, it's like, will you look at this? I've got some presents. It was like, oh, Harry. <laughs> Harry. Never got a gift before. I just want to give him a hug. I know. <laughs> what did you kid. expect? Turnips? <laughs> hey, wait a second. Turnips. No. Oh, my gosh. Okay, on a recent J versus Ben, we did the, we had the question that was, um, that was, what is the first birdie bot bean sprouts that, that Ron eats and yeah. yeah the answer is sprouts but I put turnips oh, in our this recent is J why. versus Ben this is what he said this oh, is what he says this it. is where it is so it's like it's like literally my brain like chose a word that was correct and Ron does say it but I think we had a question about what did he say or we had like a fill in the blank quiz once upon once upon a time and this was like what did you expect blank right yeah, yeah. You're right you're right <clears> and, yeah. th- and then that one was turnips but I think we got that one wrong too <laughs> yeah, probably so yeah it's a very obscure detail anyway it is uh um, <clears throat> But yeah, so uh, Harry also gets another little little nod, if you will, from Hagrid as to uh, how he will be able to eventually tackle the obstacles for the Philosopher's Stone in the form of the um, roughly cut wooden flute from Hagrid, uh, which that one again is a one to one because you literally need to play music to put <coughs> Fluffy to bed yep. and Fluffy belongs to Hagrid and the flute came from Hagrid. Um, yeah, so feels like maybe Dumbledore is like, hey, give him a flute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It's like Hagrid, if you're thinking of if you're looking for something I'm just i'm just spitballing here yeah here's an you've idea you've got some time after you're done with the trees um how are you at whittling flutes right right <laughs> and can you make them sound like an owl yeah um which incidentally is the other gift that hagrid has given harry that's true yeah. yeah maybe he could have just brought hedwig <laughs> Do what? Maybe like if Harry had just brought Hedwig, could, oh, Hedwig, could Hedwig have, have sung Fluffy to sleep? Oh, that's a good question. Ooh, that's I don't a good know. Question. Yeah. I love how uh, fascinated Ron is with the uh, shape of the money, the fifty cent piece. Which I, that was one of those where it was like, "What a shape! This is money." I was like, "Does this say more about the shape of wizard gold or of English currency?" Did you look up what a fifty pence piece looked like? I did, and it is seven sided. Se- okay, so that's yeah. what you mean by that. Se- yes. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, so it, it it is an unusual usual shape but to me i was like is it am i going to look this up and it'd be like a round coin and does that mean that wizard coins are not round <laughs> not round yeah I know. if anything it feels like inside of this story if there were coins of different shapes that were not round they would have seven sides yeah it does it, feels it like, almost feels more wizardy to have a seven-sided coin yes what when in doubt inside of harry potter trivia the answer is seven right especially if the question has something to do with a number <laughs> yeah um let's see here so and then what else do we have um, they get the they get the sweaters this is one of those things where like um because they always describe uh the Gryffindor colors as being like scarlet. Yes. Like to me, like when that scarlet's very much, I think like the English word for red, basically. It's, it's, yeah. It's like a very <coughs> vibrant, bright red. Yeah. Yeah. But so like when I was a kid, I always thought of the Gryffindor colors as basically just being maroon and gold. I agree. Like I always yeah. thought of scarlet as more maroon, which it's not. It was just like a misunderstanding. But so <laughs> Ron's complaint, I always think, remember thinking it was dumb that Ron complained that he got a maroon sweater. I'm like, but you got a Gryffindor colored sweater. Like what's the problem? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. What are you complaining about? Yeah. No. I mean, it's it's like, it, but 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 I mean, it is interesting as well because um, like the, it seems like this continues to happen with Ron and Molly, where like where it seems like for some reason like Ron just is always on the like the the. the like Molly fails to remember certain things about what's important to Ron. Right, like, like he doesn't like the corned beef sandwiches. He doesn't like the corned beef sandwiches. Doesn't and like maroon. Doesn't like maroon. And then also like, you know, his dress robes eventually end up kind of being like a little bit like like more sad. But like you never really hear about like Fred and George's dress robes being Right, sad, exactly. Know? Or Ginny's. Or, well, or I guess yeah, Gin- like, yeah. Like, <laughs> like yeah, like you know, it's like like G- Ginny got like a dress, you know. So yeah. it's uh, you know. But like that's even one of those where, like it's like Ginny's a third year. She's not even supposed, not even supposed to, to be going. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> she got asked by an upperclassman. Oh, yeah. Classic Ginny. Anyway. Classic um, indeed. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, but then of course, Harry also receives his own uh, emerald green sweater, which mm-hmm. sounds very cozy. 
Um, right. Is this the one that has the snitch on it? No, it's just, no, an, emerald, the, it's just an emerald green sweater. Just an emerald green sweater. Yeah. Which, on that note, um, neither Harry nor Ron have anything on their sweater, but both Gret and Forge do. They sure do. <laughs> <laughs> I love that that joke. I remember where they, yeah, it happens on uh, the next page. He says, I suppose she thinks you don't forget your name, but we're not stupid. We know we're called Gret and Forge. Yes. <laughs> like, I just remember that being the best joke I had ever heard. <laughs> when, yeah, when I, I, can, I can remember dad saying those words as yeah. he read this yeah. read this to us as kids it's like yep nope 100 percent. that's totally it yep um yep so that's a that's a that's a good one um and once again fred and george just really standing out as some of like my favorite characters in the story they're just always there's just always a hooting and hollering good time yeah they show up they show up so much more than you think they do i know yeah yeah, yeah. I, and I, i've always <laughs> said this and, and this is like whenever we get the question of like you know if, if they if they were to do a more long form uh which it sounds like maybe is coming anyway but longer form harry potter tv series what would you want? And, and I've always sort of said that I feel like you could you could explore other characters more. Yeah. So like you could leave Harry, Ron, and Hermione and show other aspects about like what's going on. Or like maybe you've got like a Dumbledore side story and a Fred and George side side story and then like the Golden Trio. Yeah. Like main story. You could definitely like do that. Like yeah. would you show like Fred and George with the map in year one? I think so. Oh yeah, yeah. That'd be very interesting. It, it might be <clears throat> kind of fun if you showed it subtly because this is one of those for like first time viewers. It'd be neat if you didn't know that what they were doing was using the Marauders Oh, like, map. yeah, you just see them constantly, like, putting away a piece of parchment. Yes. That, like, you, you, the experienced watcher or, like, uh, reader, knows, like, oh, that was the map. That was the thing. That yeah, was the thing but, like, the obviously place. they can't, like, name it or, like, give it its moment in the spotlight until they give it to Harry. Exactly. So I think, yeah. I think use <clears throat> patience, if anybody's asking my advice, use patience, mm-hmm. let it get there organically, but also, like, include as many, like, little nods. Uh, yes, absolutely. Possible. Like, hint out those things. Yes, for sure, for sure. Um, of, of course, the next extremely important gift that is, that is handed over during this Christmas holiday is the one, the only invisibility cloak the cloak of invisibility man this is one of those that like as i was reading through it this time it's like the impact it must be for harry to like get the note that says your father left this in my possession before he died it's like like for harry he has probably never even considered the idea like one we find out later in this chapter he doesn't know what they look like which like that oh my gosh like it's so easy to bash on the dursleys in the first couple chapters but Oh my God! They've never shown him a picture of his of parents. His parents. I like know. what? It is crazy. It so is. yeah, that is that is bananas. Oh my God! It's, it makes me so mad. But like, so to him, I mean, he doesn't even know what they look like. So the the idea that like he would ever own something that belonged to them probably is like extremely foreign. Like I can't imagine what it feels like reading that note and then to not know who it came from. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's interesting, you know, like even even like Harry, there's a couple of good moments I feel like inside of this chapter where um, where Harry is almost having these they're like the, the the kind of correct amount of like mingled feelings where where he's like happy but overwhelmed and also kind of sad at the same time. Yeah. You know, it's like like it's the same thing after he sees, you know, it's like he doesn't want to eat like breakfast after, you know, like once he finally finds the mirror. Yeah. You know? And and I, and I feel like this is sort of um you know, like a like a like a like a similar thing. So I'd give anything for one of these. He said, anything. What's the matter? Nothing, said Harry. He felt very strange. Who would send him the cloak? Had it once really belonged to his father? Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like, it's just like you can you can sort of imagine like the like the the overall sort of mixed sensations that you'd be feeling here. Like, because I mean, he does not see this coming. This is a no. total surprise, but like not in a like, oh my gosh, I'm jumping up and down on the top of my bed because this is like the greatest day of my life because I just got a gift. Like, right. You know, it's like it's a very, very different kind of experience. Um, but, but then just uh, just right on cue, uh, friend and George sort of arrive, you know, to sort of lighten the mood with their F and G sweaters, um, which is which is good stuff. I love the fact that it said Harry's is better than ours, though, said Fred holding up Harry's sweater. She obviously makes more of an effort if you're not family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, this is okay. This is another thing I thought was interesting is that when the invisibility cloak is revealed, like, and it falls on the floor, Ron is able to like identify it like immediately. Oh, yeah. Which is yeah. which is sort of unusual because like uh, we know later on in the story that like other kinds of invisibility cloaks exist, like cloaks that have been imbued with like a disillusionment charm or, or that have been guys. made out of demigod's hair or something like that. But like so other cloaks do exist. Like it's a known object to exist, but this one in particular should not like fit any description that Ron has heard before. 
Because like this is the the invisibility cloak. Yes. Right. Yes. No. I I agree with you. And and the thing. I mean, that's it's a really good point. Um. And and so I have mixed mixed thoughts because part of me is like, well, maybe it like wasn't fully established like how unique this particular one is. Mm-hmm. But also the description um that we get from it is Harry picked the shining silvery cloth off the floor. It was strange to the touch, like water woven into material. And something about that description just like it does demonstrate to me that like this is a truly unique garment yeah like like this is this is different this there, is yeah it absolutely is and there's like little things that aren't really mentioned about it like it's never there's things about the cloak that don't get attention drawn to them but like there's many times where like harry stuffs the cloak in his pocket or something and it's like you don't think about that because it just sounds like yeah he just folded it up and put it in there yeah what's what's the big deal and it's like just imagine though you're wearing you know your, your your jeans or something and you take off your winter jacket and fold it up and put it into your pocket right you know it's like cloaks are massive it's pieces a lot of, of clothing yeah, yeah. like yeah. they don't fit in a pocket but like there is a magical quality to the cloak that lets it be smaller than it should yes yeah, yeah. no i agree and and one of our other favorite uh you know fantasy series is is of course king killer chronicles or name of the wind and uh inside of that you know he does of course also receive what's called a shade yeah. um and it seems like the shade it, at least in fantasy you you know, also like abides by this sort of similar kind of magic. Where yeah. It's like, which which makes me wonder, like within fantasy, if it's sort of like, I, I have always read it to be implied that the that the cloak had some magically like magical ability to break down, um, or else is other is, is of such a remarkably fine material that when folded is just very small Mm -hmm. but then like the the flip end of a fine material is usually that it's highly like uh subject to to, like to tearing yeah it's not very durable um and in this case it seems like the cloak absolutely is like yeah it can withstand like a total beating right and all the rest so yeah there's there's something just utterly remarkable but i do agree it does seem somewhat surprising that rom would be able to recognize it and and maybe that's just sort of one of those like we got to explain it somehow. Got to explain it somehow. Although that being said, I mean, all it would take was Harry putting it on. Before Absolutely. Like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our this is um, so our our theory because now that you, once you know it's one of the Deathly Hallows, it's like um, our theory personally about the cloak is that it is made out of like Thestral hair. Yes. Right. Yeah, because yep. yeah, Thestrals are invisible on their own, and then if you know that the Peveril brothers made the wand and the Resurrection Stone. Then the uh, the elder wand has a core of a thestral. It does uh, hair thestral yep. hair tail tail hair thestral tail hair. That's you got it. There, yep, there we go. It. And then um, because it's like invisible and it's a like deathly hallow, and thestrals have to do with death. It does seem like that could be like the source of it. Yeah. And then um, we'll talk about the mirror in a second because we like we've also theorized that the mirror is related to the resurrection stone as yes. well. Yeah. But we'll get to that in a second. Yeah, we'll get to that. I was gonna say that's like one of my one of my favorite one of my favorite things. Absolutely, we've ever done. one of my favorite ones. Yeah. Um. But as long as we're talking about garments from our family members, one of the things I do love is uh this this is another line from Fred and George that just totally stood out. But it's the come on, get it on. They're lovely and warm. Like I just, I love the way that like you know there they are receiving their like annual gift that is the same gift and they're still referring to these sweaters as lovely and warm. Yeah, lovely and warm. Yeah, where is I think I did I no I don't know I don't know. I thought I had like highlighted that exact line, but because I thought that was a funny way to do. Yes, <laughs> put yeah. it on. They're lovely and warm. They're lovely. Yeah, yeah. And then, but but I mean they sort of back it up a little bit too. Again, another good friend George moment is, and you're not sitting with the prefix today either. This is of course talking to Percy. Uh, said George, Christmas is a time for family. Like this is one of those where it's like Fred and George rag on Percy basically relentlessly. Yeah. But like in this particular instance, they're like insisting, like, no, you were sitting with us at dinner tonight. Like, right. Yeah. You know, it's like like there no ifs ands or buts about it. Right. Yeah. Like they do give him a hard time, but they do like love him as their brother. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's that's just kind of like a, like a like a nice a nice special moment. Yeah. Then we of course get to such Chris, Christmas su- dinner. Yeah, yeah, with with a hundred fat roast turkeys, one hundred mountains, mountains of roast and boiled potatoes, platters of chipolatas, multiple kinds of potatoes as always. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, chipolatas, uh, terrines of buttered peas, silver boats of thick, rich gravy and cranberry sauce. It sounds amazing. It does. It like it makes so, me like, so hungry. Yeah, I'm like like literally salivating just 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 like kind of describing it. The other kind of cool thing that I that I like on behalf of Hogwarts is the fact that there are the stacks of wizard crackers every few feet along the table. Um, this is. This is kind of neat because I feel like 
it's also one of those areas where like like you know harry ultimately ends up like leaving you know with a set of um wizard chess yeah you know so like like it's almost like a way to ensure that like if you are a student who stayed behind it's kind of like a conscious awareness that like if you stayed behind it might mean that you're not receiving or don't have you know like the family to go back to to have a holiday so i, I like the fact that the crackers are not both like festive but it's also like a way to like you know for the school you to got sort something of, you got some gifts yeah. yeah yeah which is which is kind of like you know just neat uh, i had to look up what a rear admiral's hat is just it's because like a military hat right it is a military hat yeah. and i mean like if it was just a admiral's hat i would have had no questions whatsoever right yeah it's the i was like rear rear why a rear admiral's hat it's just an actual position oh, okay so, yeah that's just that's just simply it like in 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 the navy there's just yeah, the, rear just admiral. the rear admiral guys yeah. charge the back of the boat back of the boat sure. yeah yeah why not yeah. why not um I, also there's the the scene where um a flaming christmas pudding followed the turkey percy nearly broke his teeth on a silver sickle embedded in a slice uh i looked this up and this is a common um british tradition to bake items into um like the holiday puddings. oh the cake yeah yeah yep so that's a that is not just sort of like like what's the sickle doing in there it's like this is this is something that would be like you know pretty pretty common and that's cool yeah so i thought that was kind of neat uh you get like a, a a scene that doesn't seem like it would make sense in any other book especially the more you get to know the characters but um hagrid getting redder and redder in the face as he called for more wine finally kissing professor mcgonagall on the cheek who to harry's amazement giggled and blushed her top hat lopsided it's <laughs> like i feel like the more we get to know these characters the less likely that seems like that would happen i know right yeah um, <laughs> but that, but that's okay good that's okay still fun yeah. everyone just having a good christmas Christmas dinner. Yep, yep. Love both of them. Yep. Uh, Harry, of course, then gets his uh, non-explodable luminous balloons and grow your own wart kit, <laughs> 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 which is like one of those things where I'm like, I'm like, some of these gifts, including <coughs> his wizard chest set, are cool. The grow your own warts kit. I'm like, and why would you want that? <laughs> and, uh, what what is this? Act there was um on Disney Plus this year they released a new like Mickey Mouse Halloween. It's like a claymation sort of thing. Okay. That my kids watched a bunch of times and like the bad guy quote unquote is like this witch who turns them all into their costumes. Okay. So like you know like I think like Minnie becomes an actual spider oh, and da sure. Daisy is Daisy and Donald are the princess and the frog. So Donald gets turned into a frog and Daisy gets turned into a princess and she keeps joking like this worked out for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with this. <laughs> anyway, there's one scene where the witch is like getting ready for her. It, for everyone to get there and she p pulls out some like wart cream and she like puts it on her nose and all the warts like pop up and she's like ah works as advertised and I was like that's pretty funny <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's she like, wants warts because she's a witch oh, I yeah. see I see oh yeah yeah, yeah. It's, like the, yeah. it's part of it's part of the appearance you gotta yeah. have it yeah, gotta yeah, have yeah. it uh, we have our, our um, furious snowball fight on the grounds. Um, then they have more food, which also sounds good. Meal of turkey sandwiches, crumpets. Uh, wait, crumpets. Was that the word from earlier? Oh, wait. Yes. Yeah, so they have English muffins and crumpets. Hey, wait a second. Wait we, a minute. We know that word. In yeah, there you go. So English muffins earlier, but just went for straight for crumpets this time. Trifle and Christmas cake. Everyone f felt full and sleepy. This is just like, I mean, just a total aside, but I feel like there is sort of this like snow day sensation of like being out in the cold, having so much fun, but like being in the snow is exhausting. It is, yeah. Like, you know, especially if you're like sledding or like, or having a snowball fight and like running up and down a hill mm -hmm. or, or whatever. And there, there is like a warm, uh, like sleepy, dreamy state that I feel like I can like go back to from my childhood that just makes me think of this particular moment. So absolutely, I, I just like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, um, at this point in time, uh, you know, Harry is just basically like, I think he is struggling to sleep and he is thinking about the, uh, the, the cloak, cloak from his father and specifically in the note. And this is another one of those like Dumbledore's big plan nods where he specifically uses the phrase, use it well. Um, and, and like, this is like one of those things where like, if you're the headmaster of the school and you have just given one of the students quite literally a deathly hallow yeah. which i mean that aside still just an invisibility cloak and encouraging the usage of said cloak yeah like this this by itself suggests to me that like dumbledore is like like i am giving you this now now is the time to use it right like and like, i mean that is going to be doubled down later in the chapter as well yes it 100 percent yeah. is yeah. um and, and harry seems to basically just sort of like like inherently understand this like you know it's like he, he kind of knows like like there's like a draw a pull like yeah he, he's taking like, those words go. i'm gonna try i'm gonna try it i love the sentence he says you could go anywhere in this anywhere and filch would never know and it's like yeah you'd think 
You would You'd think, think that would be the case, Harry. I know, I know. The thing I wrote down too, because he's like, he could go anywhere, anywhere in the ha- castle that he wishes, and he goes to the library. I know, I'm so, like the but library, not the restricted the section. Ro- yeah. <laughs> good times, good times. Yeah. Um. No, but it is it is kind of fun to me that I feel like of of all things, like I, but it's just like yeah, he wants to go to he wants to go to the library. He wants it's to like go to the library. If you're Dumbledore and you're sitting there waiting for him in the mirror of Erised room, which he is, and, yeah, which he is, and and you're, you're like. He went to the library. Oh, come on. Uh, come on. Also, like I imagined. Also, I love that Harry's in the library and he like has he lit a lamp to see his way. And it says the lamp looked as if it was floating along in midair. And it's like, dude, that's kind of a giveaway. Like, it is what is the of point giveaway. of the cloak? If you're yeah. going to hold something outside the cloak, right? What are you right. doing? Yep. Yep. You have anonymity in the event that somebody discovers you, I would say. Yeah. Uh, which which Dumbledore himself, <laughs> when he does discover him, I think he makes like a comment, uh, something along the lines of how how um, strange how nearsighted being invisible can make you said Dumbledore, um, you know, which I think is sort of like a, like maybe maybe exactly what we're, we're witnessing happen in this on this particular page here is that he is uh, Harry is failing to realize the obvious shortcomings because he's invisible. He's right. Like, I'm safe doing whatever I want, including having my hand half exposed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no one could see me. Yep. There we go. Um, we b- he basically goes to the, the restricted section um, cracks open one of the books, which immediately starts shrieking, which is, you know, it's basically like he's his first foray with invisibility, <laughs> invisibility cloaking. Is I know g- backfiring I w- tremendously. I was wondering, it doesn't like say how he like sets the like um, chooses the book it just has a large black and silver volume caught his eye like I I was curious as I was reading that like if like if we ever come across this book again later oh, on like because like could this have been like one of the Horcrux books or something like that it totally feels like it could be yeah it like I would need yeah. to go check the description of um, whenever they get evil most or yeah magic like, most evil yeah magic most evil yeah. or whatever yeah because that, that, that is the book itself that would be that would be such a fun detail of, like Harry like accidentally like put like oh this one drew it like he was drawn to it because it was like about Horcrux no something. that would be that would be straight that'd up be, fascinating that'd be great and but, that that literally could just be the I mean if he's got the piece of Tom Riddle's soul inside of him inside of this moment then it means that Tom Riddle himself had previously held this book exactly so it, exactly yeah, it would guide him towards it I like Ooh, that. I like that yeah that's, that's just headcanon for me there it is um, yeah this, I, that was magic most evil <laughs> that was magic yeah yeah no I, I totally love that yeah. so anyway um yeah he immediately causes such a loud stir which then of course is another one of those instances where where Filch is just apparently like out patrolling uh in the middle of the night and even though he's also patrolling out in the middle of the day when when the poor man sleeps well um, there there is a little bit of a different one on the one because he goes to Snape and he says, you asked me to come directly to you, Professor, if anyone was wandering around at night and somebody has been in the library. Restricted section. So it's like he is a little bit more out there like on purpose, I guess. And it like occurred to me as I read this one that like Snape has asked Filch to come to him. So it's like I wonder like what is who is like Snape? We know is on the lookout for Quirrell though. Yes. So it's like this trap with Filch is actually meant for Quirrell, not one of the students. Yeah, I wrote the exact same note. Okay, so that to me though, and we also know Dumbledore asked Snape to look for Quirrell or whatever, and Dumbledore, we also know that Dumbledore has put the mirror in the room that it's in because he wants Harry to come find it. Yes. Right, so the mirror is a little bit more exposed and less protected on this night. So to me, the math is that Snape has Filch on the lookout for Quirrell because Dumbledore told Snape to look for Quirrell because Dumbledore knows (gasps) that where the stone is hidden is a little bit more exposed on this night. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. Even though Dumbledore himself is in the room with the mirror. <laughs> Even though Dumbledore himself. So, yeah, I mean, nobody's yeah. going to get past Dumbledore. But the other thing Dumbledore knows, and, and again, going back to Dumbledore's big plan, the thing is, is that nobody's ever going to defeat the mirror. That's the like, other thing, too. The, the mirror is, is like, literally, you know, it, th- this is the thing. It's, like, what the what the obstacles really feel like to me because it's, like, who who what kind of logic is it that it's, like, no, you can't seal this thing unless you can beat my challenges. I know, right, exactly. You know, it's, like, what it really feels like is the challenges are just a giant 
giant trap to lock you deep inside of the basement underneath the school. Right. You know, it's like, so as long as the, the traps don't hurt you along the way first, which many of them Which can, many of them could. Then you're just going to be deep inside of a cellar that you can't escape, nor can you do anything with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I like your thought there, which would be that like, yeah, on Snape is asking Filch for help because Dumbledore has asked Snape for help and it all has to do with Quirrell. And the fact is, is that what Quirrell is ultimately going to find deep in the chamber is the mirror of Erised, which is currently just in an unlocked classroom. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I, is holding the stone. Is holding the stone. Yeah. yeah. So that was going to be my, one of my questions for, for the thing is whether or not you think the stone is already in there. I do think it is. Because otherwise, like, I mean, otherwise, if it's not, then Hagrid got it from Gringotts on July 31st and it's just been out in the open in Dumbledore's office. Yeah. True. Effectively. Yeah, until you know. Christmas. So for, for yeah. what, how many months is that? Yeah. Quite a while. Yeah. For like, yeah, like for, five months or something. Yeah. yeah. That doesn't sound right. So no. I think it is already in there like even now yeah um th <coughs> this is the tiniest little note in a total aside but i did notice just uh, i i haven't normally caught these before there's a tiny jim dale narration error oh um and and sometimes it's the case that we're, we're reading the american copies versus the like the british copy and there's like little mini like you know small differences mm -hmm. and stuff um but he does refer to snape uh when it says let's see here um, because his soft, greasy voice was getting nearer, and to his horror, it was Snape. Uh, in the in the Jim Dale audiobook, he says Snipe. 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 I read, I listened snipe. to it three times just to be sure. I was like, am I hearing it wrong? It's like, no, he in fact says Snipe. Mm. So just a little, little Easter egg there. Um, but either which way, so the arrival of both Snape and Filch uh, basically forces Harry to pretty much, you know, exit the premises as yeah. quickly as he can um and interestingly it is actually running from um a situation that sort of leads him into the room uh, the unused classroom where the mirror of air set is currently being held yes um but, which sort of seems lucky like i don't know how dumbledore thought harry was just going to stumble upon the mirror but you know <coughs> I, I mean that's true and it's like this is like one of those things where it seems like you know just Dumbledore's intuition on some level that was actually going to be my first thought when it came to Harry going to the restricted se restricted section I like our magic most evil idea better but my thought was almost like if Dumbledore's just literally following Harry like from afar throughout the night like if he's like you're not in the right place and I need to guide you somewhere else if Dumbledore almost like caused the screaming. Book, oh, oh, interesting. You know, and, and Dumbledore sort of like, nope, you're not in the right spot. Keep looking. Keep moving. Keep moving. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get you there eventually. Um, so that was that was my first thought. But I, I, I much prefer the magic most evil. Yeah, and oh, I like yeah. the fact that, that would just be like a dark and terrifying, loud screaming book. Um, the magnificent mirror as high as the ceiling is an ornate gold frame standing on two clawed feet. I, I have always loved the mirror of Eris. So oh, it's, it's one a, of my yeah. favorite magical artifacts. Very cool artifact. If yep. you if you've never discovered the the not so hidden secret of it, the Eriset of course stands for desire. And if you read the inscription carved around the top backwards or in the mirror, it says, "I show not your face, but your heart's desire." Boom. Um, which is kind of like one of those cool things that I like. Just goes unexplained in the story. Like it's it's sort of like a little easter egg for you to discover yeah on your own and i love yeah. that you could solve it by sh looking at it in a mirror in a mirror it's yeah. very clever it's yeah. very clever um yep uh, at this point in time though this is uh there's a couple of interesting little bits um one of them is that harry is still wearing the invisibility cloak yeah and the mirror is still able to reflect him yes which i think will pair nicely with our next piece of of theory that we'd like to share with you guys mm -hmm. today um so basically our thought is and this goes back to something that Dumbledore will eventually say to Harry inside of King's Cross Station after Harry has, has essentially intentionally faced death uh, right at the end there. Um, but Harry asks whether or not the Deathly Hallows are real. And inside of that sentiment, Dumbledore says whether or not three brothers met death on a lonely road, I don't think so. But the three Peveril brothers were likely very gifted weather wizards and succeeded in creating those powerful objects. Yes. So what this means is that the Peveril brothers, once upon a time, dating back before the founding of Hogwarts, I believe. I th it's, it's very hard to say yeah. um, whether the Peverils came first or the founders came first because okay. we know at the very least at some point the Slytherin 
line intermingles with the sec the second brother's line, right? Because yes. the um, the resurrection stone becomes a gaunt family heirloom. You're correct. Yeah, yeah, because they think it's the Peveril coat of <coughs> arms, um, not the not the symbol of the Deathly Hallows. Okay, so that's a good point. But either way, what it means is that these these men were once upon a time, possibly a full millennium ago, uh, were quite the inventors and were able to create things that even within the the confines or the not the lack of confines of magic are able to do things that that standard magic cannot do right um and so they they all sort of have you know possibly different underlying objectives uh and one of one of my proposed or one of our proposed theories rather is that the second brother basically sought to create the resurrection stone so right. if you take away the idea that death plucked a river stone and, and turned it into the ability to bring back your your lost love right or, or, well that's know. what he's really trying to do is bring back his lost fiance, uh, fiance. yes yeah. exactly so we we know that the second brother's true objective is is effectively to do that um and so what we have proposed before is that prior to the creation of the resurrection stone the second brother encountered a boggart and what the boggart typically is capable of doing is creating uh, your worst fear in physical form. And the the basis of the thought here is that if the second brother was like, well, what if we were able to inverse the ability of the boggart and get it to show you your heart's truest desire? So maybe what you might say is that it reflects the ability right, yeah. <laughs> of like, the yeah. boggart. <laughs> right. Um, and, and essentially what he would have created or or taken a boggart and done is transfigured it into the mirror of Eris. Yeah, or like trapped it in a mirror in the way that Dumbledore puts the stone in the mirror or something. Yeah, yes, yeah. precisely. Yep, exactly. And um, pretty much the thought is is that we know that the resurrection stone ultimately is the the downfall of the second brother, and what it does is not um, bring him what he truly desires, but like sort of like a, a a a very light version of his lost love, as if seen through a veil, as if seen through a veil. Yeah. So it's interesting to me, and it feels like because there's a line in here when Harry is seeing Lily, it says he noticed that she was crying so like that to me is very interesting because it sounds like it it really is like lily standing there it's not like because when he sees her he doesn't even know who it is right you know yeah like and yet she's already crying right so it's like he like it's it seems like it's truly lily and james like staring at him from beyond from beyond like yes. it's not just like it's not just harry's desire it's like i mean it is his desire but it's not just like reflecting what he wants because again he doesn't even know what they look like right and it's like and it is showing exactly them they show up anyway without him knowing what they look like so right. there's that and then the fact that she is able to have like an emotional reaction to cry right is that like that this is it's like it's them this is the informed lily who knows that this boy has lived without her exactly exactly so there's that and then it's like and, but then like harry is able to call them back with the resurrection stone as well right in like the same way so like it it does seem like it's sort of the same magic at play it in does. both cases and, and in both cases i mean even dumbledore's own description of the dangers of the mirror mirror of Arised is that men have wasted away before it right and and i i think you could make the argument that the second brother wasted away on like uh, upon his usage of the resurrection stone right um so anyway that's I, I i think it fits so beautifully so perfectly um and even the fact that you know th th this is a question for you i mean we know that at one point in time dumbledore sought the deathly hallows kind of seems like the mirror of eris had was in his possession oh it seems like yeah he's the one who has it like yeah i mean he we know it was there when uh, at least during the time of Fantastic Beasts as well. Yes, yes. And so I, he, he's had it since, f since at least the 1930s? Yeah, so at least since then. It's like whether it belongs to the castle or Dumbledore is kind of up for debate. Right. But he certainly knows about it and used it then. Right, right. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. So anyway, my, my headcanon in this particular case is that the, the Mirror of Air said was created by the second brother. By the second brother. Yep. Yeah, although, man, as I'm thinking about it, there's like not, um, like the... The second brother we know brings back his fiance with the resurrection stone right. and like because he can't be with her he ends up like um uh killing himself. Yeah. Right. But we also know that Voldemort is a descendant of the second brother, right? So how does he have a descendant? So how does he have any descendants? 
right? Like, because for that to be true, it basically means, because like, it, it means he must have either had a, who, Cadmus. Cadmus is the second brother. Yes, Cadmus. So, yeah. And it seems like Cadmus had one great love. So it, it just sounds like they must have had a child together before they got married. But then... Where is the child? <laughs> Where is the child? Yeah, I does mean, he just abandon the child? It's it's hard to know yeah. because I mean the primary premise of the story that we hear includes the idea of of death himself. Yeah, granting these three gifts to yeah. the three brothers, and and I tend to believe Dumbledore's version of it more. Yeah, um, when it really comes down to it, so I think that they were talented wizards. So I mean. On some level, the idea of even if um, Cadmus were to have had a child with someone else, it almost even feels like it would fit in the same way that Tom Riddle was the product of, you know, Merope, Merope Gaunt and um, Tom Riddle Sr., mm -hmm. where it's like um, like an otherwise sort of unrequited love. Yeah. You know, like like he's the product of... If Cadmus's child, that was the start of that lineage, sort of also shared that commonality with Tom Riddle himself, Voldemort himself. Yeah. Like the product of... Uh, it, what am I trying to say here? Not being the product of love. It, like, it feels like that would be possibly something that would it that could would be. that would fit um but, but whoever the child is they must end up with the ring too like he must have you know because the or he must end up with the stone sure because it yep. stays in the family this is a good point right so there's like a there's like a missing peveril child along the way well here. <laughs> as per as per ever i mean you know this this goes back to our, our deepest desire you know if, if like we talked about you know there being a long form harry potter series but what we would truly love above all else is is like a founder series and i could completely see a world i would be okay with adjusting the canon to reflect a world where the peverils and the founders exist in the same sequence of events mm, mm. In, in some capacity or else if the peverils are relevant to that narrative in some way shape or form. It does seem like that would have to be the case in in some way shape or form as well yeah um or like yeah that they could they could at least like meet them or something because they would otherwise be three great powerful wizards of the day that's the thing yeah, yeah exactly exactly so i mean even even a world where you could have opposing ideals where the founders themselves are more in the spirit of we need to share our magical knowledge and i could see a world where the peverils are highly talented wizards who did the opposite and right. they, they thought we don't share Right. What we know, mm -hmm. you know, and that's part of what makes those artifacts in particular because nobody else has ever made anything else like them. I know. Yeah. So it's it, I mean, they, they stand alone in their unique abilities. Yeah. I mean, I could, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if they like all interacted with each other because you could definitely see like Salazar interacting with Cadmus or something in some way as like a little like, oh, well, their offspring are going to get together someday or something. Yeah, they're, yeah they're, they are. Yeah. yeah well, true. this is the other thing that people don't think about is that Salazar Slytherin, they're like, oh, has, I, a has a child. Has a child. He has a child. He has a child. Yeah. Like yeah. there is a great lost love somewhere with Salazar Slytherin yes. as well. And it's yes. like that, that part, like mm, there's something there that we don't know about. We, we, that. we could, we could tangent so hard and uh. just, just go into all of our thoughts and feelings on, on like what the mm. founder's life was like and, and how Slytherin attained his, his, you know, what is otherwise infamous perspective on, you know, relations between the wizarding and non wizarding populations yes. and oh, stuff. I mean, such. There's such thoughts I have. Such yeah. thoughts I have. Right. No, I know. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, in the meantime. In the meantime, um, Harry seeing his family for the first time. I was going to say, we, we literally tangented right before like the most impactful portion of the whole chapter. <laughs> well, it's a very sad part. It is very sad. Maybe we were just, maybe we were, just, uh, mm -hmm. we were, we were uh, delaying the inevitable, which is just this, this idea of such a young child who has basically had to live you know, essentially like a solitary existence, doesn't know what his own family looks like and is now being granted <sighs> the ability to look into the faces of his two Just parents. Just hate the Dursleys. Like, I, I that, boy, I don't know. I mean, they're obviously terrible to him, but I'm just circling back to it in my mind. Like, it has not occurred to me before that Petunia never showed Harry a picture of, of her, her, of her even just of her at least Lily. Yeah. At, Oh my God! It makes me so bad. I know, and, and this is, and I, I think it's just a deleted movie scene only, which breaks my heart that they deleted it. But there, there is one scene I believe from Deathly Hallows, 
part one where the Dursleys are leaving and there's an exchange with Petunia where she basically says like you're not the only one who lost someone that day and it's always been one of those things that I think humanizes Petunia in a way that's helpful Mm -hmm. um, where it's sort of like like maybe maybe part of like this this great big defense that she has the reason that she she has such hostility towards magic like like at this point isn't even her jealousy from childhood but it's more the mourning sensation she's experiencing attached to the loss of her sister who she once loved so dearly yeah you know and it's just like like it just it just sucks all the way around so i i much prefer a world where petunia has like like more of like a deep struggle not not that it's defensible um in any capacity nor that harry should ever have been subjected to the life that he was subjected to but um anyway that's that's my thoughts on that um but yeah so harry harry gets this experience of um being able to look into the faces of his his two parents. She was a very pretty woman. She had dark red hair and her eyes. Her eyes are just like mine, Harry thought, edging a little closer to the glass. Bright green, exactly the same shape. But then he noticed that she was crying, smiling but crying at the same time. The tall, thin, black-haired man standing next to her put his arm around her. He wore glasses, and his hair was very untidy. Um, this is this is just like it's a very cool moment. It's amazing to see Harry seeing himself and his two parents. I love the way in which Harry embodies both parents and his physical attributes. Um, one of the one of the details that I've only just recently stumbled across that I've been curious to hear your, to hear your thoughts on is whether or not James is. Patronus and Animagus form as a stag is at all supposed to reflect his extremely untidy hair. Like oh, it, oh, like, oh, like it, his hair sticks up like antlers. Like antlers. <laughs> yeah. Is, is that like supposed to be a thing? Or is, I don't I, know. I that, um, that, I mean, it, it, it could be there. It could it, be. I mean, it always looks like, I never imagine Harry's like hair sticking up like antler style. I always imagine there being like a cowlick in the back that like won't go down or something. Yeah, it's it's always messier <clears throat> than I feel like the movies ever depicted. You know, like yeah, like especially true. in in uh in in the first movie, he's almost got more of like like just like a long bowl cut. It's yeah, not, it's not exactly like unruly. Right. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so it's that just just such a good moment. Um. And then of course, yeah, mom. He whispered, Dad. Just break, uh, break you right in half. It's so sad. Just a moment of uh, silence. So much worse as a parent, too. I know. Oh, my gosh. I can't imagine can't your kid having imagine. that experience. So anyway, um, we can work ourselves through this. We can surely do it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So it's in in the movie he only sees his parents and in the in the book he actually sees like his entire extended family back there. Yep. Which is kind of cool. Um, gosh, yeah. Anyway, well, then he runs back to Ron. Yeah, well, I guess it's the next morning. Yeah. Uh, I th- yeah, so he says, you could have woken me up, said Ron crossly. You can come tonight. I'm going back. I want to show you the mirror. Um, I, I love the fact that Ron immediately says, I'd love to see your mom and dad. And I know. You know what a good ha- friend. I know, but then Harry matches and he says, and I want to see all your family, all the Weasleys. You'll be able to show me your other brothers and everyone. Um, and Ron's like, you can see them any old time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, whatever. They're not very special. <laughs> right, right. Which kind of plays into it like Ron. It's like he says that like as if like, oh yeah, whatever. They're just there. But then like Ron's deepest ambition like a page later is to like to to like be just like all of them. Well, it's to be just like all of them, but there's a couple of like th- there is all also the additional layer for Ron in that like he is constantly um, having to try to find a way to stand out amongst the siblings because yeah. he is just standing alone right uh, when when Ron looks in the mirror and the kind of interesting thing about Ron and in, in what he's seeing in the mirror is it says no I'm alone but I'm different I look older and I'm head boy I'm wearing the badge like Bill used to and I'm holding the house cup the Quidditch cup I'm Quidditch captain too um, what's what's kind of fascinating about this is that like it is Almost all of this, in some capacity, sort of comes to fruition. Maybe not quite to the extent that that Ron's envisioning it here. But on the one hand, Ron, in his fifth year, does become um, a prefect. Yep. Um, he is on the Quidditch team. Mm-hmm. He is the hero. You know, there's the whole Weasley is our king. Uh, he's the one who's able to bring home the Quidditch cup. Yep. But even the alone thing is oddly reflected in that part of him being the hero of the team comes in the wake of uh, Fred, George, and Harry all being kicked off the right. team. Yeah. So like Ron seeing himself alone, it does almost like foreshadow like, and then eventually alone, Ron is the one right. to, you know, like a well, Ginny's still on the team. 
Is but I guess he's not being compared. I guess even in this sense, he's not comparing himself to her. It's like to all of his older brothers. That's true. So yeah, there's that. that. But yeah. Shadow. Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, he does always want to stand out. And then he ultimately, like, you know, does defeat, you know, one of the Horcruxes and all that. So, yeah, he stands out pretty good. Yeah, Ron does a good job. Yeah, good, good job. job. Good job. Yeah. 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 Way, to go, way to go, Ron. Way to go, Ron. <laughs> solid, um, solid work. Yes, yes. Uh, it, it is kind of interesting, and I'd be curious. I mean, it doesn't take very long before we get the full explanation, but I'd be curious if, if people would be able to, you know, start to piece together uh, what exactly is going on, like why they're seeing different things or, or you know, like what the underlying function mm-hmm. of the mirror is, which I think sort of like tease us up uh, for Harry going back on his third night, which I guess at this point in time is December 27th. Yep. Because we would have gone on Christmas. Uh, the next night with Ron and the, the 27th. Yep. Yep. Um, at this point in time, uh, Harry finds his way back to the room. Once again, he's looking into uh, the faces of his mother and father when he hears somebody in the room with him. So back again, Harry. Yes. Back again means that he knows about the other two times. Yes. Yes, he does. Yep. So the, the big question to me is sort of whether or not. Yeah. Like was, was is Dumbledore just <coughs> in the room on each occasion he almost has to be because um well he at the very least has to be there on the second night because he knows what ron saw in the mirror too R- yes right yes so there's exactly. that and it's like it seems unusual to me that he wouldn't have been there the first night um and the, the way he says so back again like it doesn't sound like I mean, I guess you could just mean like, oh, you were here last night and tonight. That could be again. But like it almost like implies like, oh, again, again. Right. Like like it's like I think he's been there every single night. Yes. Yeah. Seeing what um, what Harry uh, is seeing. Yes. So um, the strange how nearsighted being invisible can make. It was like he knows Harry's been out in the invisibility cloak because, of course, he knows he's the one who gave it to him. Yes. Of which Harry doesn't know. Uh, And he's like smiling at Harry. So it's like "Ah, you've you've done beautifully, Harry. Like, you know, not only did you get the cloak, you put it on, you found the mirror and what you saw in the mirror. My God, I'm just beaming over here. Like, this is great. Could not be more proud. Could Could not. not Yeah. Proud. Um, Then, of course, uh, you know, we get the the explanation, you know, basically the happy man on earth would be able to use the mirror of Eris head like a normal mirror. That is, he would look into it and see himself exactly as he is, uh, which I put uh, just an ounce of emphasis on because I feel like when Dumbledore himself is asked the question, uh, what would you see when you look in the mirror? Um, Dumbledore basically says, I see myself uh, holding a pair of thick woolen socks. Um, this is This is sort of like a you could interpret it a couple of different ways. The socks modifier is certainly a rather small one in the scheme of things. Yeah. You know, it would basically mean that like Dumbledore's most like, like he basically sees himself exactly as he is with a pair of socks. Right. You know, it's like, that's what I really need because people only give me books, but I really I know, still it's need. Like, it's like, it's not that hard to get socks. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it feels yeah. like you could do that. Dumbledore on a, on a headmaster, Sally, it's attainable. What is, yeah. what's interesting is that we eventually learn what Dumbledore would see in the mirror and it is just his family together and whole, which is uh, awesome. But when you think about it, it's basically the same thing Harry sees. Yes. You know, a little bit, which also pretty much tracks um, with, like if you get more into like Dumbledore's history, like with the um in what is it, Secrets of Dumbledore, at the end of it, like the chillin' like kneels to him and declares him as pure of heart or whatever. Yes. And it's like, oh, th- that's sort of almost like more proof of it. Like like Dumbledore is basically so proud of Harry because Harry sees he's like, Do you know how many few how few people could see what you saw in the mirror? But it's like Dumbledore also basically sees what Harry sees in the mirror. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So like I, I think that this is this is probably verification for Dumbledore at this point in time. Like this this boy is like like a piece of me like you know yeah. he, he like he's he's already like he's very it. pure he's very pure but, but like and like Dumbledore wouldn't have seen that until later in life like much later in life correct as well because we know that um as a as a much younger Dumbledore not even a much younger like uh, yeah, I don't 40 know. 50 yeah. years prior 40 50 years prior Dumbledore is seeing Grindelwald in the mirror yes yeah yeah so like it like Harry arrives there he's like basically born and is as pure as Dumbledore eventually gets to much later in life. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, um, he even says that to Harry. He's like, I've known for a long time now that you're a much better man than me or whatever. And it's like, yeah, it's like, I've known since the moment you saw that mirror. I was like, whoa, okay, this kid. Yes. Yes. 
answer is yeah. yes. Uh, and that being said, um, we then get the line. And this is the last like little like major wink from uh, Dumbledore's big plan kind of concept. The mirror, the mirror will be moved to a new home tomorrow, Harry. And I ask you not go looking for it again. And if you ever do run across it, you will now be prepared. <laughs> Yeah, you know, what do you like mean? You're... If you do run across it, and I know where it'll be hidden in a secret chamber under the school where no one should ever run across it ever, but if you do see it... Yeah, now you, now you, you know, know what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I'm like, what do you mean you know what? You'll, you'll be prepared. Prepared for what? To see his parents again? Like, right. what does he need to be prepared for? Right, but it, I mean, it all seems to like fit together to me. It's like basically like, okay, it's it's the winter holidays. It's a great time to present Harry with a gift, especially anonymously, because it's sort of like, you know, like it's a, it's a time where it's not just like, oh, like the broomstick, you know? Like, it, it's like, this is a time when people receive gift so we can like innocuously present the gift right it's also when most of the students are not inside of the school right the gift itself presents the ability to then wander about the school so it's like the the mirror being where it is when it is during this particular time all of Dumbledore's like you know meddling all all but suggests to me that he's basically like okay here's the moment like mm-hmm. we are we are inside of the 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 stage of the plan where there's nobody we don't have to worry about anybody stumbling in on us he will he will absolutely you know as long as he's his, his father's son he will go exploring in the middle of the night you know my, yeah. my hope is that he will just stumble across the mirror because he just need like the one thing that that i you know that i can't count on ron or hermione or his other teachers to to impart upon him you know is how and what the mirror actually is so this is the occasion right let's do it and, we, and into the process dumbledore is also testing harry's worthiness yeah, that he is. That he is. And that pretty much brings us to the end of the chapter. I don't have a ton more to say, but the final sentence is just, uh, but then he thought as he shoved Scabbers off his pillow, it had been quite a personal question. And I was just like, man, oh, g- g- look at you, Peter, sleeping on Harry's pillow. How dare you? What a, what a, just How a, what a jerk. How dare you? What yeah, the, no. Harry, the Harry, gall on that rat. I know. I, especially because like what Harry is going to do on these occasions where he's not in his own bed is to see his parents. The parents they, who are not there because of Peter. I I know, I know <laughs> exactly. And like Scabber, like Peter knows. He's even watching him go under the cloak. They would have seen James doing it. Yeah. Like, ugh. Oh, uh, Peter sucks. Peter does suck. Oh Peter, my gosh. He's like as bad as the Dursleys. Oh my gosh. And Aunt Marge, who I also don't like at all. Aunt Marge um, is basically like Umbridge Light. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned. The the thing, the thing that I sort of love, you know, to sort of to, to close off the chapter, the thing that, that is fascinating to me is about the mirror of Eris. Like I always wonder, you know, and, and of course the, the ever personal question. I'm like, what would you see inside of the mirror of Eric's yeah. head? I think a lot of times for me, I always find it like I feel like it would be rather informative. Like, I think in a lot of ways, there's a part of me that like, you know, I know the things that I deeply value. I know the things that are important to me. But like, I almost feel like if I were to look into the mirror of Eris head and have something proven back to me, it's like, Ben, the thing you value the most is this. Right. And it's like, I think it would like sort of like solidify because like, I think I'm able to underestimate every important thing in some way, shape or form, Mm -hmm. or, or I'll like, I'll like let myself believe like, Oh, it's cliche for that to be like, you know, for, for, for this to be the most important thing to me. Like that's, that's you're, you're, you're following the storybook logic, you know, or something like that, you know? Um, but what is, what is truly achieving world peace or something, Ben should be like the most important thing to you. Like, yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Like, you know, I mean, that (laughs) don't be so basic. What what do you see in the mirror? I see myself achieving world peace, of course, as should everybody. Right. Yeah. (laughs) The correct answer. Right. 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 Yeah. It's like, no, you see yourself just like sitting on a beach and you know some some type of really cool place and maybe there's like some treasure to be found and like a boat kind of station just offshore it's like it's like like it would be so interesting for me to look in the mirror and be like that it been literally i'm telling you right now that is what you want the most do you think you'd be surprised by what you saw i think i, I think i would be surprised by what i saw yeah um i i do genuinely and i i also feel like i would pursue it um, yeah, I feel like it, it could because like, yeah, I think you're right. I think people are good at lying to themselves. I think so. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, I think it's hard to know. Like you you can th- it's like anything else. Like what's your what's your Patronus? What's your bogger? You know, like they're all they're all like highly informative questions. What house are you in? Um, they're all questions that sort of like show some piece of your character or, or what you value the most. But like it's a complicated question to answer. Yeah. It is. So for me to be presented with the answer to that question, like that's like the like that maybe that's uh, maybe that's what I would see is me knowing the answer. Uh, right. Like, yeah. Maybe above all else, what I would love is to just know what I would see. Maybe. 
Maybe. So anyway, uh, maybe, maybe what that means is that I would see a version of myself looking into the mirror and that version of me inside of the mirror would be like jumping for joy because that version of me knows what I saw. Oh, very meta. Oh, yeah. Yeah, know, the meta yeah. mirror. The meta mirror. Classic. Right. Anyway, uh, as ever, we need to review the chapter art, which I feel like yes, we, never, we, we never review very aggressively, but um, I... <laughs> It's basically just Harry looking into the mirror. It is Harry looking into the mirror. Um, I think that we, you and I uh, have mirrors in our homes that are kind of like nice gold or, or, or not real gold. Not obviously. real, yeah. But we, we, we bought the same Calm one. down. Yeah, but they're, they're mirror of said esque mirrors. They are, yeah. Um, I, I do tend to, I, I actually, I will say in this particular instance, I actually like the movie prop version of the mirror more than the the presented illustration although oh, yeah. i do like how grand and tall it is in the chapter art yeah but i see it more as a um uh it's it's a rectangle mirror in the chapter art and i see it more as like a uh i don't know like it comes to like a point like an arched like yeah, an arched like, yeah something like yeah, that yeah yep. in the the chapter art almost makes it look like it like was an animal or something like it's got like 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 its clawed feet are like were feet and like it's the stand on the back was like a tail or something. You're right. Yeah, it yeah. seems to look like it could have been like a lion or something. Yeah, it kind of it does. Lion is exactly what I was thinking too. Because yeah. maybe because the mirror is sort of in the shape of like a uh, like a mane or like the frame kind of looks like a mane. Yep. And yep. then it's as if like which is it's kind of funny because Harry is in a Gryffindor looking. And it's like what is the reflected lion in you or something? You know. Oh yeah, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Yep. Even at the top, if you look carefully, it almost seems like a pair of eyes kind of kind of right up top there it little, does you're right circles. it kind of looks like little little uh, circles actually, there you know if you really look at it it kind of looks like baby grogu from star wars oh my gosh you're you right if you, i definitely see it yeah that's kind of amazing a thousand percent yeah oh, that's man. amazing that's so funny anyway okay, okay so great chapter art well there done we harry i love how giant the mirror looks in comparison to, i guess it's like 12 feet tall or something right it's huge. i believe so yeah yeah, yeah. it seems like very tall very Massive tall but we mirror. also know considering the the height of the troll that even just the bathrooms in hogwarts have pretty high ceilings yeah so, it's, it's a big old big old place lots, big old place lots of room for vertical yep. furniture let's see and then uh, as ever we have a review from one of our amazing listeners um this oh man i didn't copy the name oh, i'm sorry about that oh no it just says amazing so good i'm from sweden but live live in england and peppermint humbugs are a british sweet or candy i listen to the podcast every day please can you do more than one episode a week all my friends and family listen to this podcast so thank you for inventing it oh, oh. that's so amazing man I, 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 I don't think we'll do more than one a week thank you for the suggestion um, but we want to, you know, give ourselves a lot of runway here. However, we have discussed doing like after we've like finished a book, putting together like a like a, a, a giant like super cut so you could listen to us review all 17 chapters at once. Yeah, like one. Yeah, one, one uh, after the other. One big long 17 hour. 17 cut. hour. Yeah. Cut. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like, what I like about this though is that you could go to bed at night, start listening to chapter one, wake up the next morning and not be done. And not not be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah so. I, that that would be that would be something. That'd be the longest video we'd ever uploaded anywhere. This is the longest podcast, longest episode of this podcast. So there you go. We've done basically one and a half for you on today anyway there you go that's yeah. exactly right that's exactly it so uh as ever guys thank you so much for tuning into this week's chapter it like i said from the very beginning this is one of my favorite chapters in the entire story in fact so i'm glad that we were able to uh provide as much commentary as we were uh but otherwise until next time we will see you through the gryffindor